Hi, my name is Ritesh Bowri. I'm an entrepreneur and also the father of two wonderful children. Interestingly, I'm also someone who's almost died 14 times in my life. From being in a near plane crash to being lost in a jungle, I've seen it all. Seven years ago, I experienced what was hopefully my last near-death experience. I just turned 40. I was diabetic. I was hypertensive. I'd always suffered from asthma and I had acidity for at least 20 years. Thanks to the intervention of Professor Ravi Rajan, I was able to reverse all these conditions in 90 days. I was hooked. I had to learn more. Since then, I've read thousands of medical journals and hundreds of books. I've certified myself in physiology from the Harvard Medical School and in nutrition from the Tufts Medical School. I just had to understand what was happening in the human body. I've started Breathe Again, a platform dedicated to helping people live a very long and a very healthy life. We've been able to impact thousands of people, reverse lifestyle conditions. You know, the really interesting thing is that even the World Health Organization calls lifestyle diseases potentially reversible. Are we saying that if you just simply made some lifestyle changes, seven of the top 10 reasons why we're dying could be reversed or at least the risk could be reduced? To find out more, I put together the Ritesh Powery Show, where we talk to experts and regular people, understand from them what's going on with their lives and how all of us can live a very long and a very healthy life. Welcome to the show. The Ritesh Bhavri Show. I'm exceptionally pleased to welcome my friend and mentor in many ways, Dr. Rajiv Kumar. Dr. Rajiv Kumar just recently retired as the head of the Niti Aayog. He was the vice chairperson reporting directly to the prime minister. In his illustrious career, he's worn many hats. He's worked in the ADB, the Asian Development Bank. He's also worked with FIKI very closely, actually in some sense representing uh, industry. But today, actually, we want to go behind the person we see on television very often, uh, whether it was CNBC or NDTV, and actually get to understand the person. Who is he? How is he thinking? What is his understanding of dhyan, a notion that we will come to learn about very quickly? Uh, but in many ways, my friend, my mentor, and a well-wisher, Dr. Rajiv Kumar, welcome to the show. Hello, sir. I'm very excited to have you on the show, the Ritesh Powery Show. You know, one of the things I really enjoy about my role is the opportunity to actually meet lots of interesting people. I hope today I'm going to learn a lot from you. I hope the listeners are going to learn a lot from you. A couple of years ago, I had the opportunity to meet the Prime Minister in the context of health. By far the highlight of this entire journey of health as far as I'm concerned. I know you work very closely with him. What is it like actually to work with the Prime Minister? Uh, what do you learn from him? I mean, it was, it was an experience of a lifetime. Sure. And um, it's incredible uh, the kind of learning that I, I had working with him. Absolutely. And his vision, actually. And I think the thing which impressed me most is his vision about the country. Absolutely. His commitment and dedication to the country. He is one who, one can say, is almost impatient uh, with the desire of changing the country, changing the people and improving the people's welfare. And I, one incident that I recall before I started working in Niti Aayog and I had the chance to meet with him. And Interact, I, I, sure. And we were having a, a sort of lunch together and, uh, and he said, uh, yes, all of those things are good, but I really want to start by making toilets available for the ladies, oh, interesting. for the women of this country. And as an economist, it just came with a complete shock. Absolutely. You know, because you are always talking highfalutin things, etc. Exactly. Here was a person, he had just been elected and the Niti Aayog was being formed yeah. as a part of a committee which was getting into this. Absolutely. And I was amazed. And then suddenly I saw how valuable that was. Yeah. You know, and so I think that, that commitment to the person at the bottom of the pyramid. Exactly. And to get him, her, uh, up the ladder exactly. know, ahead. I think it's just fascinating and, and one should, and I learned a lot. Yeah. And, and, yeah. and the other thing is that he lets you be, he lets you yeah. get on with it. Once he's uh, established his you know, sort of a roadmap as it were, then you've got the freedom to do what you want to do. And, um, but at the same time, he's, you know, he's Always constantly, watching. you yeah. know, yeah. that uh, exactly. he is, uh, he's monitoring you. He's impatient. He's, he's monitoring yeah, you. Yeah, you know, absolutely. So, so, uh, so his vision, his commitment, dedication, and his uh, eye to the detail, yeah. all of that are very impressive and it's been a privilege, a real privilege. Exactly. We are blessed uh, in fact. To work with him, to learn from him. Yeah. And uh, as an economist, undoubtedly in the best four years, four and a half years of my life. 
And so what I found really fascinating was that 45 minutes that I spent with the Prime Minister, he was all completely years. He was just willing to listen to me. Here was this young person who just sort of ventured into the world of health. And here was the Prime Minister of our country listening so patiently. He spent 45 minutes. He may have asked three or four questions, literally just to understand what I was trying to say. But he was just completely all ears, willing to listen, willing to understand. And just literally soaking in, absorbing, trying to understand what was this person saying, what new could he learn, what new could he discover, what more could he understand. And I think by far that is greatest attribute, the ability to just listen to anyone, learn and, and sort of imbibe from them and sort of absorb from them what they have to say. I think by far the greatest skill that he has. No, actually, this is... Uh and this is what um, has really impressed me because I, I think of myself as a person who wants to learn every day. Absolutely. In fact, if somebody asked me, I said, what is your... I said, the best thing would be if I could learn something new to the last day of my life. Right. You know, that would be the... And he is constantly Correct. Uh, learning from every possible source. Right. And uh, as a result of which he, in a sense, renews himself. Absolutely. And moves forward. And I think that's something that one can learn from him all the time. And, and the other thing is that, you know, his, uh, I repeat myself, which is that his vision for a new India, an India which can go back to its glorious days yeah. of the pre-colonial times, you know, when we were, you know, about 16-17% of the world GDP right. and held our, and people came looking for us yeah. as, the, as, as the bird of gold. And I think he wants to, he, he wants to set India on that path and wants to, more importantly, I think, wants to change the mindset of, uh, uh, of Indians to believe that they can do this. That is possible, absolutely. That is possible. I yeah. think that's the key. Right. To, you know, to change the mindset of the people that, look, this is all possible, it's all up to us. And if we get together and get on with it, we can recreate the glorious days of India again and make India, make the 21st century, India century. And I think that's what he is striving for. Absolutely incredible, sir. So today I really want to make this conversation about you, sir. Uh, let me narrate a really funny story. Prior to the start of this shoot, this entire morning has been completely chaotic. One of the guests was actually supposed to fly in from Jaipur. I found out only this morning, did not have a ticket. So there was the chaos that was sort of unfolding as we were trying to sort of put together this show. Uh, finally, I just sat down and meditated. I said, there is no other answer. The only thing I can do is sit down and just quiet my mind. I know you've been someone who's uh, a deep practitioner and I'd very, very much like to learn from you. What is this practice, uh, Kundalini Yoga, Sahaj Yoga? What is it? What can we learn? How could we maybe sort of imbibe it into our lives? If you could perhaps talk about that, I think it would be extremely useful to me and also to the audience. Ritesh, this has been a transformative uh, experience for me. Before I started that, I was a complete atheist. Sure. And I had a Marxist background, so I didn't believe in all of that. And I started it with a great deal of reluctance and skepticism. Sure. And uh, I think the uh, what it has enabled me to... I started this in 1988. Wonderful. So it's been now more than 34, 35 years that I've been practicing it. The amazing part of this is that it doesn't require you to give up anything at all. I see. So you lead, you lead a normal life. And you, you fulfill all your dharmas, whether that of a father, son, husband, citizen, official, etc. Sure. So the whole thing about, uh, you know, leaving the world yeah, going off some somewhere, yeah, that's, sure. that's not it. And what it does, you, it does what, it, what it is based on is thousands of years old, found in Markande Puran and has been talked about by every uh, incarnation, and, you know, which has ever come into this world. And it is simply the fact that you, uh, you discover that the divine energy which runs this whole cosmos, a reflection of that is also within you. I see. And you desire that this energy which is residing within you, it's in desi it resides in the tailbone which the Greeks used to call sacrum bone. Sure. And they knew that this is a sacrum bone. And this is the Kundalini Shakti and which enters the fetus when it is eight weeks old, through okay. the Brahmaran, through the Sahasra, sure. the part which is uh, uh, slightly soft when the baby is born. Is born, yes, of and course. And they go and they, it sort of, uh, you know, it vibrates your entire body and then settles down in that final, you know, the tail, in, in, in the muladhar, sure. uh, in the sacrum bone. 
and waits for the child, waits the person to desire that it gets awakened again. And if we, if the person desires that it gets, you know, that it, and has a Satguru, and the definition of a Satguru is one whose only job is to connect the human, the person with the divine. I see. There is no other job. I see. So he or she doesn't do anything else. In the presence of such a Satguru, this Kundalini rises along the Sushumana Nari and then goes back to where it came from. I see. And connects with this cosmic world. And as a, as a result of that, what happens is that you get the ability, the courage uh, to remain in the present and behave spontaneously. I see. And uh, the duality between the heart and the head slowly begins to disappear. That's one thing. And this and the other thing that happens is that uh, you become inward looking and trying to find peace within rather than outside. How wonderful. But, but, the, but the more fascinating thing is that the nature, God, has created the entire subtle system within us. Right. By which it works. I mean, I, you know, we have got the three channels, uh, which uh, Kabir had described as Ida, Pingala, Sushmana. Sure. You know, they're there. Uh, you know, there's a solar and the, and then you've got the chakras, which coincide with all the plexuses. Sure. And each plexus uh, con- controls, as it were, the organs around that body. So it's a, you know, pelvic plexus, plexus cervical plexus, aortic plexus, uh, and the optical chasma, and so on. And the Kundalini, as it rises, in its desire to go back to connect with the Divine. And by the way, this connection, this union of the energy within with the energy outside is the Yoga. I see. Because Yoga means union. Right. The union between. Of course, yeah. So that's because you see, therefore you don't do Yoga, you achieve Yoga. I see. And, you know, and, and therefore, uh, and this is what Krishna has also said in Gita. So as you achieve Yoga and, and, and this connection, you stay in the present. Okay. So, because thoughts arise either from the past or from the, the future. future. Of course. Within that, there is a vilamb, and you get into the vilamb, and once you're there, you become thoughtless, and what you achieve, therefore, is nirvichar samadhi. Okay. And nirvicharita, you cannot achieve consciously because the function of the mind is to think. Is to think, exactly. So you can't yeah. go beyond. So, Absolutely. it has to be. Something beyond, beyond, beyond the, that, yeah, beyond the mind. Absolutely. But that's what the Kundalini helps you to achieve. And once you are there, you slowly get to expand this area of thoughtlessness. And that's a sense of very deep peace. And you energize yourself every time you do that. And you can do it anywhere. Okay. You can do it in, you know, anytime, anywhere, in the midst of a crowd, in the flight, in a you know, path, etc. And you just have to go inwards and desire that your Kundalini comes up and reaches here, and as it connects, you become thoughtless, and you can enjoy those vibrations in, in that situation. And my, my own personal belief is that, you know, the, even the Ganga that you see coming out of Shiva's head, yeah. is nothing else but the divine energy coming up, you know, and, and it's symbolically of course, represented. Yeah. And the Buddha, you know, if you see his picture, the head, they, they always show a Correct. top thing. Yeah. Same thing, and every, every, spiritual practice in the world talks, talks about, about this. this. Right. And I think the best thing is done by two people. One, the Adi Shankracharya, sure. who was the believer in Advait, that what exists out, you know, God is what within you, right. and therefore you don't have, there is no other. And the other one is Sant Gyaneshwar, who in his wonderful book called Gyaneshwari, in the sixth chapter, actually describes the Kundalini. So it's nothing new. It had been kept a secret because it was unfortunately taken over by tantrics. Okay. And they distorted it completely and they perverted it. Okay. But uh, it is the wonderful invention of Sri Mataji Nirmala Devi. Sure. Who discovered, who gave all of this to this world. Back again. In May 1970. Right. By opening her own sastra uh, on the 5th of May 1970. And ever since then, it is spread to a hundred and odd countries. I see. And people from every possible religious background or caste or creed or community are in it, are practicing it. And I have, as I said, benefited materially, emotionally, physically, health-wise, in every possible way. What else could you ask, in fact? God, honestly, what else could you ask? Exactly. But how, so just for my understanding, how would you practice? What I do is that I, uh, twice a day, in the morning and in the evening, 
I sit before uh, Sri Mataji's photograph sure. because that represents uh, the Sadhguru sure. and sitting before her and then you use the five elements because after all, all of us are made up of these five Physical, elements yeah, sure. and the balance of the five elements, if it is maintained, you achieve you know good health, good mental health, etc. And I simply sit down and I close my eyes and I desire that I become thoughtless. And that's all that you need to do. How wonderful. That's all. Because you, if you try anything, then... You, By then definition, you, actually. Then, you, then you're not yeah. doing that. Yeah, and, and you see, and, the, and, and I need to explain. See, because when you try, you're working on your pingala nadi. Right, okay. And the, you know, the right solar channel, this comes to the left. And as soon as you try for something, it's invariably, your ego will develop. Right. Because, you know, that's what, what I have done. I this. can do this, exactly. I have done this. Yeah, absolutely. And ego is one of your worst enemies to get you away from the divine. Right. So one is the ego, the other is the lunar channel which gives you the conditionings. Sure. And the and conditioning meaning habits. Oh, I can't do this, I can't do this, etc, etc. And the, in the middle is the uh, Sushumna Nadi on which rises the Kundalini. And once it rises, what you do is you give up all your habits and you therefore become a perpetual learner and change. Change becomes a constant. Sure. And you, have, you take to change sort of naturally. Sure. And you give up slowly but surely, your ego subsides. Sure. And as I said, just twice a day. Uh, now it can be ten minutes. It can be twenty minutes. It, if you are really enjoying yourself, can be and you're in that state. And by the way, what she says, therefore, is that you don't believe my word for it. And therefore, to that she has given us a test, which is that when you are in balance and when you are connected, the vibrations which run this whole cosmos, you can feel them on the palms of your hand. I see. And actually, and, and it's it's a physical, tangible manifestation. Yeah, sure. And and he says, if you don't, then you give up. You don't take my word for it. And therefore, she's completely against any blind faith. She herself uh, studied medicine for four years in Lahore, uh, you know, before she was, she was married, and therefore knows about. It. And what appealed to me were two things. One, the in some sense the rationality and the stricture against blind faith, because otherwise I found. Every other practice, Correct, exactly. you have to do this. Yeah, know, and and yeah. They, more often they will sort of make you afraid. If you don't Correct. do this, this is a it's prescription. None of yeah. that. Yeah. Prescription and yeah. you know, some kind of a threat. And the other, that's one thing which appealed to me the most. The second thing is that in this practice, she combines all the religious leaders and founders and incarnations. So if you are a Sahaja Yogi and if you want your Kundalini to rise, you have to respect and believe every incarnation. And I give you examples. The Muladhar Chak, the deity is Ganesh. Okay. That he's a Pratham Puj, and that exists below the Muladhar. Okay. So it, Ganesha is the one which gives you permission. At the same time, the Agya Chak, the third eye, the deity is uh, Jesus Christ. I see. With Mary. You know, and the heart is Shiva with Parvati and Durga. You know, and, and then there are ten primordial masters which make up your Guru principle which are around the Manipur Chak. Right. And the Manipur Chak is, uh, you know, is Lakshmi Narayan and around them are the ten masters according to her, which is Lao Tse, Confucius, Moses, Abraham, Guru Nanak, Muhammad, Shirdi Sai, Raja Janak and Adi Guru Dattatre. So, you have to respect each All faiths them, in some sense, yeah. You know, and, and, and therefore in Sahaja Yoga, and that's the second thing because in this day and age, when the forces are so divisive and also where the technology is such that the divisions can actually get exacerbated. Yeah, and yeah. this is one practice which integrates everybody and asks you to come together. So the result of which when I go to a place like Turkey or Morocco or US or Japan, yeah. it's wonderful to find, or China, it's wonderful to find people, Other people. talking the same language. Sure, sure. You know, and we just find a community uh, of uh, people who are only interested in finding their spiritual depth sure. and, and not any mumbo jumbo, anything at all. By the way, the third thing which did uh, really impress me is, is a very strong nationalism. I see. And the sense that, because she says that India is where the Adi Kundalini is. And okay. India is which was the Vishwa Guru and which has given to the world the knowledge and the curiosity of finding out the relationship between the human and God. Okay. And the fact that the human being is in the image of God and it only has to find herself uh, to become uh, godly, if you like. 
Okay. And there's no other country in the world which has gone that far. And these are our old traditions, you know, which are enumerated by people like Kabir and Nanak and Ramdas and you know and Namdev and Gyaneshwar sure. and Adi Shankaracharya. So we have had this long tradition. And that to me, because I have, if anything, I've been a nationalist all my life. Uh, so that also was a very strong appeal for me. Very much appealed, exactly. Uh, as an Indian, I, sure. I must say, I have not yet transgressed, uh, I have not become a global citizen, but I hope that Sahaja Yoga will take me there. Sure, wonderful. In fact, I practice a form of meditation called Zazen, uh, very similar to what you described, where you're not trying to control the entire process through your mind. Human beings by nature want to use the mind to control, to regulate, to do. But the idea that you can go beyond the mind in some sense, and that's really meditation is, you know, what, what yeah. we're sort of uh, practicing. But you wanted to mention something about uh, why you started. Yeah, w one that um, my, my oldest son was two and a half years old and he developed asthma. And we ran from one doctor to the other to the other and so on and no cure. Sure. And once I was sitting in, uh, I think, September and I found that my medical bill reimbursement for the whole year had already uh, you know, been spent. And a colleague of mine said, Ajeev, uh, how is this? You're a young family. There must be some imbalance. Isn't that so? And I said, that just kind of clicked. And I, yeah. Then I went for a search as to what this. And that then, uh, and I realized then uh, it is that he was so right that, you know, that our life, my wife and I and my son, you know, we were leading a rather stressful sure. life and so on. And that is how I got into Sahaj. I went back to the person who himself was a doctor uh, and uh, he was uh, he was paralyzed and then cured by Sahaj I see. completely. I know, see. And still there. And you know, th th all the left side was there and went back to him and he then, um, you know, learned as it were. And lo and behold, my son, Asthma, went because Complete. our own... Uh, vibrations, the vibrations of the house, the yeah. stress, yeah. etc., all slowly sort of disappeared. And the great thing about this practice is that you don't have to go to anybody else to keep practicing and learning. Because what Shimadaji has said is that you become your own guru. Sure. You know, once the guru principle awakens within you, yeah. that I described, which is around the Bhavsagar, sure. you know, and, and on the middle of which is the Manipur Chakra, chakra then you can give this experience to everybody else. I for see. For example, I had this amazing experience for about nine years I was in the Philippines. And I must have uh, given, uh, you know, I must have helped at least 3,000, 2,000 people, you know, to achieve this. And that's even more satisfying. Of course. When you see other people, you know, benefiting from this. So, so Sahaj Yog in that sense is a, is a unique form of practice, which is that it's based on your own experience. Sure. It's not a it's not a question of arguing or reading, etc. And the fact that you can be on your own journey yeah. at your own timing yeah. as long as you're only honest to yourself. Self, absolutely. And you're not accountable to anybody. Anyone else. else. And and that I think is a is an amazing uh, form of a spiritual practice. Because it uh, helps you to grow deeper. Yeah. And at the same time benefits you in all aspects in, of your life, as I said, materially, physically, emotionally, financially, if you like, sure. uh, in every which way, and, and helps to make your relationships better. How wonderful. You know, because uh, the Vishuddhi Chakra, which is the chakra of, the, of Lord Krishna, is a chakra where if it, you know, if, it, if it becomes better, then you start behaving with everybody as an equal. I see. And, and not otherwise, you normally we are doing either this or that. Correct, yeah. You know, yeah. And I made, I experienced that in the government very much. Yeah. And if you change that yeah. to being a sambhav, yeah. you know, which is represented by Krishna's Raslila, then you are changing the entire basis of your relationship. Oh, so wonderful. the whole social structure can actually benefit. Uh, one, because you cut across all religions, yeah. all nationalities, and yeah. two, that you see Everyone everybody isn't. else as also reflecting godliness as you are doing. How wonderful. Therefore become equal. How wonderful. I really hope through the medium of this show, you know, maybe we can take these numbers up to millions of people. I, like hope I really so. hope millions of people watch. And the learning from, you know, whatever you said is so wonderful. Thank but you for the opportunity. Of Probably. course, sir. No, of course. It's an honor to have you here. It's really an honor. So if you notice almost everything that we've talked about so far is about the mindset in some sense. Even the yoga practice that you're talking about is in some sense controlling 
or regulating or supervising in some sense the mind. Uh, from the little bit I know about you, you have this mindset of always doing 100% in whatever you're doing. What is this mindset, sir? How did you develop it? How do you work on it on a constant basis? How can others sort of maybe emulate? The, the, the honest answer is that uh, this has happened to me. Okay. I haven't done it. Okay. And this has happened. This is an outcome of the meditative practice. Okay. Because as you do this and as you get into the habit of remaining only in the present, sure. then you focus only on one thing that you're doing at that time. Right. And your mind is not distracted. Otherwise, mind is called... In, in, in our tradition, it's called like a deer. Sure. You know, that is running all over the place and it's everywhere. But if you are you know, in meditation and if you are in that vilamb, etc., then you do just this, you become like a digital thing. Zero, sure. one, zero, one. You do something, forget that, you go on to the other sure. one and move on to the And that's what you do. That's one part of it. Sure. The second part of it is that you have to uh, do whatever you do, you do uh, as it were uh, outside of yourself. Okay. I mean, you are not involved. Is not that's the other aspect of it is that if you do everything in some sense a surrender sure. that look you are you are just the medium right you know and it's not me and you know so on and achieve it then that that's the other part which is that then what happens is that you don't evoke the negative uh, you know sort of reactions from the other people and you get you are able to then get to the results rather quickly sure. you know and then and and come to conclusions you know which uh, you know, which otherwise you would not you know, not be able to do. So and that's the part of the ego part, sure. you know, which is that if you do, if you are interacting or if you're, you know, do, doing things sort of, you know, uh, non-egoistically, then you achieve a better mindset. And the third, I think, the part really is that, uh, you know, that uh, uh, you can always uh, come to everything in a in a manner of learning. Sure. And if you do that, then if you're learning, then you have to be focused. Right. And as long as that happens, then then you can, you know, complete it. Uh, you know yourself. So that's the. I think that's the way I would look at it. And uh, 100% is something which uh, can only happen to you. I see. You can't achieve it through trying. How interesting. I, I think that's the way I, I would put it actually. How interesting. So if I could share my own journey, like we are a business family, fourth generation entrepreneur. I think growing up, my mindset was always that I am the owner in some sense. I just need to command and things will happen. And I think gradually over time I realized that I think 99.99% of what was happening was besides me. It had nothing to do with me at all. Mm -hmm. I just happened to be one of those cogs in the wheel. Mm -hmm. I just happened to be in a particular position. Mm -hmm. But it's a painful learning, sir. It's a painful learning to realize how you are actually not as significant as you'd like yourself to think. Well, uh, for me it didn't become painful because I realized through my meditation practice sure. that the Brahman is so huge and this cosmic energy is so vast and so yeah. powerful yeah. that you are but a speck right. in all of this. Right. And I think you know once you begin to get connected even for a short period of time, sure. your ego begins to diminish. Sure. And the feeling of I-ness, you know, you know to because, dissipate. It's a wonderful analogy that Sri Mataji gives, which is that as long as you are a drop, yeah. then you are a drop and the I-ness remains. But once a drop goes into the ocean, yeah. it becomes a part of the ocean. But then gets also empowered with the whole ocean. Correct, absolutely. Right? So the you know once the drop drops its dropness, yeah, yeah. you know then it becomes all How powerful. wonderful! How wonderful! You know? So that's that's the way I think uh, you know in some sense fully focused, fully concentrated, yeah, and with all the energy as it were working towards finding the Whatever solution and driving it. Sure. Forward. How wonderful! And you know I have actually seen that in real life with you as well. I don't know if you remember this, but when we first had conversations about health. Much like we talked about the Prime Minister being a very patient li listener, you were equally uh, willing to listen, you were equally willing to sort of uh, understand my point of view. That mindset was truly incredible for me, that here was somebody with the stature that you had, and so willing to listen, so willing to imbibe, and so willing to actually do. You literally said, great. You know, if yeah. someone's... And Ritesh, what is, it has helped me in many ways. For yeah. example, in, in Niti Aayog, I had, I had no idea for, you know, for, of Ayurveda before right. this. And then I, you know, met and I talked, and then this whole thing arose that I should integrate it and in, into the mainstream medicine, etc. I set up a committee, and and all because I just listened patiently sure. to people who came up with me with new ideas. Right. And I think uh, this is where uh, my own personal belief is that uh, if Niti Aayog can become, as it were, uh, the place where people feel encouraged to come with new ideas, right, and they will get a response. Yeah. Uh, you know, and you can get the response only if 
as the, you know, and I'm not, I don't even hold a candle to the Prime Minister. Sure. This is why he's so successful. Correct. That anybody can go with him with a new idea. And if it resonates with him, he will listen. He will not only listen, but activate it. Yeah, wonderful. And take it forward. Absolutely. I think that's the way to do it. And you know, sir, it is obviously as a citizen, you know, it always uh, sort of concerns us that people who are in positions of power should also bring a calm mind yeah. to the table. Because imagine, God forbid, you're taking a decision that's affecting the nation and you've had a bad day that day. Yeah. Just imagine you know, the kinds of decisions that could happen. Yeah. So I think it's absolutely wonderful. Yeah. Truly, yeah. truly, truly wonderful. Yeah, you know, and I, what I've noticed very often is that in the government, a lot of uh, decisions are not taken because of uh, because egos clash. Sure. And then at that time, almost nothing matters. You know, the people's welfare or the national you know, welfare, etc., or the national cause, and people get entangled. Yeah. So, if you, as you said, if people were karma, yeah, and were not interacting with the, you know, with their egos, yeah, then you would have so much more traction and so much more progress. Sure. And you know, and I think that's where, if we can all get into this balance state that yeah. you talk about all yeah. the time, yeah, yeah, you know, that balance is key. Absolutely. In taking uh, taking society forward. Sure. In taking ourselves forward. Sure. And therefore taking the nation forward. Absolutely. So the technical term is a term called homeostasis, uh, uh, which frankly was a great discovery for me. The fact that at some in some sense, the human body is a machine. It comes with tolerances, limits, battery limits under which you can operate. And if the manual that came along with me when I was born said, you know, it would say, listen, operate this person within these limits. So that's in some sense this notion of balance, that there are limits under which we can operate the human body. And if you stay within your limits, actually all is well. Uh, which actually brings me to the next, uh, you know, sort of topic that I'd love to chat with you about, which is health. Uh, ultimately, I do want to talk about health. Health is an integral part of what we do here on this show. I know you've been someone who's very, very focused on your health. Uh, you take a lot of effort, you put in a lot of initiative. I know you're very, very disciplined. Could you talk us through you know, how your approach to health has been? What is your thinking? From, from very early on, actually, I think it started in school, which is that I had a very tough housemaster as okay. in boarding. Okay. And he was from the army. Okay. And he would make us get up at 5.30 in the morning and take us to the field. I see. You know, and uh, get that, you know, and, and that feeling of you know, being well, and, right. you know, being able to enjoy sport and be active, I think remained with me and I've ever therefore always been uh, you know, playing sports, sure. you know, so hockey and so on. And, and you know, I realized uh, as I grew older that being physically fit yeah. keeps you also mentally happy. Absolutely. You know, and if you're not physically fit, therefore, then you, know, then, then you don't. And, but that requires a kind of a regimen. Sure. And I've uh, therefore uh, be- done that and believe, believed in that. So the emotional mental mind part is taken care of by the by the dhyana, Yoga, yeah, sure. by the meditation but the but your atma is housed in this temple yeah. which is called the body correct and therefore it's your job to clean the temple and keep it nice and healthy and you know in good shape yeah. because you know if you want to go forward so as a result of which i have therefore been able to maintain this regime of uh, you know combining both uh, hatha yoga and the asanas and so on with some uh, gym training. Okay. And uh, now that I don't play, uh, you know, squash or hockey or whatever. So and and I've done that regularly. But okay. also, at the same time, is it? It's not. It's not a fetish with me. You know, I do it enough, as it were, to you know, to keep uh, you know, to keep healthy, to keep my body uh, in good shape. And uh, what is um, taking me along is simply just this, as I said that um, I, I don't want to be physically dependent on anybody. anyone. Yeah, sure. You sure. know, and, and, and my hope is that until the last day, I would sort of be healthy and go to bed. Yeah. And thank you. Sure. You know, so sure. That, and that's what that's what keeps me going. And I sure. think uh, and it's helped a lot. Sure. Because if you keep, you know, if you, if you keep fit. Yeah. Then uh, the rest follows. Yeah. And uh, I think that's that's what basically it. How wonderful. So one of the things I keep on joking about is, you know, if you think of human invention, you could think of human innovation. Let's assume the Boeing 747 is the pinnacle of uh, human invention. But if you took a hammer and banged the Boeing 747, it couldn't self-repair. The human body is the only engine that can actually self-repair. So each time you exercise, yes. each time you do something to your bone, you do something to your muscle, you break some fiber and you get new ones back. And that's the process of renewal that un- you, know, you undergo in the human body. Your bones repair, your muscles repair, your heart muscles repair, your lung muscles repair. In fact, all the time, the human body is actually sort of uh, renewing itself. 
And that's really what's wonderful about uh, exercise. But you're also someone who tests very frequently. So you, you actually get blood tests very frequently, which is very counterintuitive in some sense because most people get themselves tested when they're sick. So I have high fever, I'll go to hospital, get myself tested. But preventive testing is not something that's very common. I, it's someone, something I believe in a lot. And I know you're someone who actually believes and practices this. Could you talk us through that thinking? Yeah. What is it you're doing? The first thing I wanted to say though is that Ritesh, I've learned a lot about the, the way body works from you. Sure. You know, about things about, you know, self-repairing and cells and okay. and cells getting destroyed and great. And that's been very good. And sure. also how, uh, what you eat sure. and etc. you know, makes such a, such a difference. It does. Uh, you know, and, and it wasn't there with me. You know? right. I hadn't given, that, given it that much attention. Uh, because I had followed the principle that your body will demand what it requires. Intuitively, it is, yeah. Intuitively, you yeah. know, because the three guna, you know, the yeah. rajas, tamas and yeah. sattvic and yeah. so on. So I had followed that. But thank you for that. Sure. That's one part. The second part is that preventive uh, testing, etc. Uh, came to me when I was working in the Asian Development Bank. Sure. Uh, which is that they would have an annual test irrespective of who you were and how old you were, etc., etc. Wonderful. And that was just, uh, th that was good. And I, and I wish that every organization in this country could implement could implement that yeah. you know in the government and in the corporate world yeah. etc yeah. it will save the country billions and billions of dollars and in fact at one point i did yeah. a study when i was in ecria yeah. uh, to calculate the return on uh, preventive health absolutely you know you, you give medical reimbursement yeah. for the time that you've been to a doctor or to a hospital yeah. but you don't give any reimbursement to a chap who goes to a gym absolutely and which is what you should do yeah. if the people are reimbursed yeah. For a yoga teacher, yeah. then that will save you, you know, and, and that 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 will save you lots, and that you know, and, and productivity enhancement, etc. Yeah. Yeah. So the the preventive health culture has to be built in Absolutely. into our society in a very big way. Yeah. And uh, the more we do it, the better. And this is why I follow it even now. Right. You know, and uh, and I and I benefited from it. Yeah. yeah. You know, because you catch the Early. ailment Absolutely. much earlier. Yeah. yeah. And then you are able to repair it at much lower cost. Correct. Uh, then what we'll be able to do it. But I mean, to repeat myself, I yeah. think it is time for us in this country to th think about incentivizing preventive health. Absolutely. You know, and I, the sooner we do it, the better off we yeah. no, In fact, there's so many powerful messages that you've actually made or given in this, in this uh, short uh, sort of statement that you made. Uh, this whole notion of preventive health care, actually, sir, the, the science is actually fairly simple. Your body is also constantly making an effort to repair and renew. Mm -hmm. And the quicker you can detect anomalies, something that's amiss, and the quicker you can actually act to correct it, the more likely you are to actually be okay. And I think that mindset that you're talking about or that belief that the sooner you discover, yes. the better. That's really powerful. Mm -hmm. The other thing that you said that was very interesting, sir, was this notion of intuitive eating. Mm -hmm. Actually, if you read history and you read the history of uh, human culture, uh, there was a point in time in our culture, in our history, where intuitive eating actually made a lot of sense. So if I discovered a watermelon and I ate it and I found it was sweet, then everyone after me could eat the watermelon. Or if I discovered a poisonous mushroom and I ate it and it wasn't very pleasant, and I also died as an outcome of that, then at least everyone else would not eat it. Today, unfortunately, sir, the problem is that we are seduced by so much of uh, what I would loosely call sales. So many people trying to sell us what is actually intuitive eating that the ability to discern between what is truly intuitive eating and what you're just almost in some sense being seduced to eat is uh, so you know, sort of overlapping today. It's impossible actually to, to, do, to follow what you're saying, which is that yeah. intuitive eating. So you need someone to in some sense go back yeah. and help you rediscover what it is that you actually, your body is actually demanding. Actually true, and, and that is where tests help a lot. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if you come out you know, with, you know, if you do, your some elements are lower and etc. you're reading and then you can, Try to do that, and I absolutely. think that that's a great help. Yeah. And you're absolutely right. That yeah. Just one part of it, which is that I find that a lot of ailments, diseases, etc., uh, are uh, you know the, the stress is a, is a is an underestimated uh, thing. Sure. I mean, stress does lead to a number of ailments. Sure. I've seen this in my own life. So you were talking about stress uh, playing a very important role in the outcome of health. Uh, maybe if you could just help us understand what you were trying to say. If you get into situations and if you are not able to take a detached view of things, then very often what you get is that the stress keeps building up. And sure. as the stress builds up, then all kinds of things result you know, physiologically with that. Sure. Whether it's uh, you know, diabetes or it's uh, 
you know, stomach ailments or heart problems yeah. or all of that, I think, uh, and which is what brings me back to uh, the meditation thing, that if we all can practice, you know, meditation, and lower the level of stress that we are living across with, the world, yeah. Sure. Then I think you'll be much better off sure. in your physical health as well. Sure. Of course, emotionally and mentally you'll be better off sure. in any case. Sure. In fact, that's one of the things I keep asking myself. Like we were taught one, two, three, four. We were taught ABCD, but how come we were not taught more about health? Yes. And in that context, also a yeah. lot more about meditation yeah. and eating well and exercising and things like that. They just did were not part we of not the, part of or at least the integral part of what we were being no. taught. How true, sir. I also want to turn to a very interesting topic, which is natural healing in some sense. So if you look at India, and you know, I just share a little experience that I have. So I try to bring a medical sort of approach to whatever I do. I try to bring a scientific approach to the conversation I'm having. But as Indians, all of us will listen to that science, listen to the you know, sort of uh, jargon, but ultimately come down to garlic and onion, uh, onion and uh, you know, uh, ginger. So everything is fine, but you can eat it. And other khilane se mere sare sab kuch problems theek ho jayenge. So there's an inherent natural tendency that we have as Indians to lean towards natural. I know you're also a very big believer in natural healing versus medicines or medical intervention. Could you talk us through that a little bit? I'm more into um, Ayurveda. Sure. Because I benefited from that. And I find that uh, Ayurveda is a science. Sure. Uh, which is not yet fully recognized because uh, as somebody, as one bad put it, Vaid Balindu Prakash, ki Ayurveda mein pranam hai, but praman nahi hai. Right. You, know, you have the results, but you don't have the evidence yeah. to yeah. Show, show for it. But the fact is that for centuries, yeah. people worked. have been practicing it, people have been benefiting from it. Yeah. And Ayurveda uses all natural products. Right. You know, whether it's mostly herbal, let's say, but even when they used uh, metals, I mean, they were using them in a manner which is so refined yeah. that if you, you know, that it, it's all natural. Sure. But also with Ayurveda comes the fact of your having to combine it with yam, niyam, asan sure. you know, and discipline etc. So all of that is uh, true as well. So you know the, the vat, pit, kaf, it's you know, your stages. So I think uh, there is a lot going here. Which for example, I mean a very, uh, maybe not a good, I, not, I hope not a poor example is that if you stick to seasonal vegetables, yeah. you are more chance of not going wrong. Sure than otherwise. Sure. Or if you, therefore you know that there is some tendency within you for one of the, uh, you know, uh, elements uh, being sort of uh, aggravated, sure. then you can lower it by not taking, not consuming food which will further aggravate it. Sure. And I think you do the same, sure. as it were. Sure. And I think, and this is where, because of its centuries old tradition, uh, being converted sometimes quite wrongly into grandmother's yeah. sort yeah. of, you know, Nani uh, recipes. Yeah. You, 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 people get mixed up. Correct. So I think it is time now to convert Ayurveda into a real science. Yeah, absolutely. And the more resources we can put into it, yeah. the better off we would be. Because I think it's far, far better. It's effective. Yeah. It's less expensive. Yeah. And it's based on you know creating a balance again. We come Correct. back to the balance. Exactly. Between your within your body and within your body and nature. Yeah. You know, and I think that's why. And that's what I'm, uh, try, I am tried very hard yeah. in Niti Aayog to bring Ayurveda into uh, the mainstream. Correct. And the Chinese have done it, you know, for their own medicine. Yeah. And we are not able to do it. And I think uh, it is time now right. for the new India to rediscover the great merits of Ayurveda and convert that into a science. So it is preventive in many ways, sir. Yes. But if you, if you permit as a younger person, if I could perhaps present my point of view, that I'm a logical person, I'm a rational person, I look for evidence in whatever I'm being told. And the challenge I have with uh, Indian practices, whether it's naturopathy, whether it's Ayurveda, is the evidence is not so forthcoming. Mm -hmm. If I look for research reports which are peer reviewed and has been done in a laboratory somewhere that says, listen, if you have this particular form of herb or this particular form of medicine, then these are the outcomes. So for example, going back to my ginger story, Let's say I were to prescribe someone to have ginger, I wouldn't know how much to prescribe. Is it a gram? Is it two grams? Is it three grams? Under what condition? I think that's really the challenge of Ayurveda and naturopathy. If you could have much more evidence-based yes. uh, sort of research that tells us exactly what you need to do, I think a lot more people would be happy to no, follow. You are absolutely right. And thankfully, some of it is beginning to happen yeah. in some many very prestigious institutes. Okay. Like the S. Vyasa, which was started off by Dr. Nagend, or the Jamnagar Ayurveda University or the you know or this one in 
you know, in, in Rudrapur, uh, where uh, Dr. Belinda Prakash, Fahd Belinda Prakash has 1,500 cases of documented cases of pancreatitis Chha. being cured uh, with Ayurveda. I see. And, and let's take an example that, you know, what I, we know that uh, having haldi is a good thing. Absolutely. You know, yeah. but we don't have the evidence, yeah. you know, how many micrograms, how yeah. many this and that yeah. and other. And we need to do that. Yeah. You know, so therefore, the kind of research that ICMR is doing in other fields, if they could focus all their, you know, much more of their resources on Ayurveda. And yeah. I, you know, I, I don't know if you, I mentioned to you, also there are now more and more innovations happening. Sure. There is a person who has now developed drops, eye drops which can cure cataract. Sure. And there is sure. evidence of that. Sure. Now again, you, you need more tests, more clinical labs and so on. But there are there is another person who's got these oils, which is based on Sangadhar Sangita, sure. you know, by which he has actually helped uh, maybe few thousand people you know, get over COVID. You know, now these are the people and these innovations are the ones that you need all the backing, all the support yeah. of our society and of yeah. our government, yeah. which I find is still lacking. Sure. And I think that's where we, that's where we need to turn sure. uh, to take us to, to, to go forward. And if way. I may say so, also have someone like you with your stature talking about this in a public yes. forum, yeah. talking you know to people listening yeah. through this show about the fact that this is evidence-based, yes. this actually works. Yes. Because there are far too many people who are just simply afraid. Because yeah. they just say, listen, if I say this, yeah. who knows what people might think. Sure. My qualifications, so to speak, sure. might sure. get actually affected. <laughs> no, so in that sense, I think it's just wonderful that you're actually no, stepping no, no. up and just you know talking and about it. And I hope it catches on. Right. Because it really does work. Right. And I've seen this in action. Right. And I've seen this many ways in action. And I said this actually to a meeting of the... Um, I forget the excess society, but it was in Ames and all the doctors were there. That uh, myself, I was told that I would had to get my knee replacement for five years because I was getting osteoarthritis. And here I am sitting in front of you, 12 years from that incident. Wonderful. Walking, you know, with the help of... No Arvada. problem at all, yeah. No problem at all. Absolutely. So there you go. Sure. So it does work. Sure. So I think it's time that all of us pay much more attention to indigenous system of medicine and make it scientific, make it evidence-based, give them the equipment that they require, yeah. you know, uh, for all of these cases. And I, I, I think that's where we need to go forward at this point of time. No, this is absolutely wonderful, sir. I'm so glad that you've actually stepped up and you're talking about this yeah. because coming from a position of your stature, I think hopefully millions of people will take something away, somebody may, so. may actually so. start something, somebody may do I, something, I really hope so. somebody may even just simply follow and this is just yeah. wonderful. But it leads me to a very interesting question that I have in my head, uh, which is the fact that, you know, as practices such as this and, you know, frankly, even modern medicine uh, is evolving and developing, we're now getting to this point where we, we're beginning to talk about longevity, mm. the fact that we don't need to live to, let's say, 60, 70, 80 years. Uh, in fact, the average age of the human being is already about 70 plus. Uh, they are now talking about 200 years, 300 years, maybe even 500 years. Uh, as Indians, we are people who believe in karma. We believe that we are born in some sense to undo or you know, redo or whatever you want to believe, uh, past lives. Now imagine I were to live 30, 40 years versus to live 400 years. How does that sort of juxtapose in some sense to karma? Am I getting 10 opportunities to redeem myself? Am I just getting a longer window to redeem myself? Can I live the first hundred years in a terrible way and just say, okay, the next hundred is, you know, the right time for me to be redeeming myself? How, how does this play out? I'm just fascinated. Honestly, I haven't thought about it. Right. Because uh, I'm not yet uh, thinking about longevity of that order. But right. you're right now that people are getting into that. But, you know, in the Indian tradition, there has been cases of people living for hundreds of years. There has been. You know, and, 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 you know, and Dadij, for example, yeah. you know, he was in the Samadhi and the ants built there you know, a mound over him and Correct. his bones were used for the Vajra. Yeah. And uh, the way I have looked at it is that you can do that, you can yeah. achieve that when your entropy yeah. goes down to zero. Sure. Right? And that entropy going down to zero means that you have to be in a state of complete unison sure. with the nature sure. and that you don't need to consume at all, etc. Yeah. Now, I am not sure whether karma will change in any case. Sure. What will happen is that uh, those of us who need all that time to get over our prarabdh or karma, we'll probably How wonderful. On the other hand, yeah. those of us who've already done a lot Whatever of good, etc., yeah. we'll get our moksha 
and go away Correct. and be one with the nature, which Absolutely. is what you want to be. Yeah. But that's the Hindu tradition. Yeah. That you don't want to repeat this cycle whether however long. Yeah. You just want to get, you know, melt away as yeah. it were yeah. into yeah. the cosmic energy. Yeah. So I think therefore that uh, longevity, the way it's being explained is just a purely material concept and yeah. doesn't involve the spirit. Yeah. And I think we need to get to that. How wonderful, yeah. sir. In fact, if, if I could share a story, I am somebody who likes to sort of overcome, if, if you will, uh, apprehensions, anxieties, fears. So, for example, I was somebody who was absolutely morbidly afraid of flying because my mother and I almost died in a plane crash. So after that, for you know, five, seven years, it was terrible for me to fly. Uh, death has, in some sense, been one of those things, mm. not just uh, personal, but also of those loved ones around me. And I've actually been on this journey to, in some sense, overcome, embrace, if you will, this notion that death is actually just another window. You're opening another window to hopefully a better life. And I think that's kind of what you're saying, yes. that I, I don't need a long period of time. You don't need. Which is in some sense so conflicting with what's happening in the world around us. Yeah. Because we literally have billionaires who are spending billions of dollars saying this and I can conquer death. Mm, but to what end yeah, is I my agree. question. I agree. You know, and I think that's the part which comes to you only through spiritual seeking. Right. You know, which is that uh, you don't really want, but, but at the same time, if you're a complete hedonist, yeah. I mean, then you probably need hundreds of years yeah. and then still not get satisfied. Probably not be satisfied. Uh, at the still end not end. satisfied. Yeah. But, you know, as Kabir said, yeah. uh, Jab santosh dhan, sab dhan dhur saman. Right. So then, then why would you need any of that? Right. Know, and I think a, lot, a very large number of very evolved people yeah. uh, had very short lives here. Right. You know, including Adi Shankara right. or Gyaneshwar, they, right. you know, they passed away in their 30s. Yeah. You know, and so even the, even Christ. Yeah. He yeah. was 33, I think, or yeah. 34, Correct. you know. So you don't need... So a long life. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. If you see yourself as a part of nature, yeah. then this longevity business, I think is, is very much egoistic. Right. You know, that I will... I can do this, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, human beings are, you know, free to... Inherently... Play. But the point is that yeah. I think it's time for us to evolve from being homo sapiens yeah. uh, to homo spiritualis. Right, sure. How and well put. That's, uh, that's where we want to go. Sure. And that's why we are here. Sure. And I think all of this must start with the people, us also asking us, what is the purpose of our life? Yeah, why am I here? Why am I here? Exactly. And the way Indian tradition has answered it is that I am here to become one with God. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, whatever, the, you know, and I think that if that is so, yeah. then you don't need the length of time to achieve that. Sure. It's the, it's more the depth, sure. if you like, sure. and the intensity of your desire, yeah. you know, to be, to achieve that union, which I think is more important. How wonderful, sir. Which leads me to a fascinating question, the next question that I had in my head, that uh, one of the theories that has been put forward is that as uh, evolution occurred and man got consciousness, we actually had the help of psychedelics. So one of the theories that is put, put forward is this notion of magic mushrooms, which is now actually coming back in vogue. There's a very popular author called Michael Pollan, who's talking about uh, your mind on, on uh, psychedelics in some sense. And he's saying that uh, actually the use of psychedelics, marijuana, for example, mushrooms, for example, helped create that state of consciousness because your mind just sort of slowed down. You achieved in some sense meditative state. I know India has had a history, uh, so uh, Shivratri is a time when we actually do consume such, such. I, I just don't want to take the name on the show, but it's not uncommon for us to be consuming these things. What is your thoughts? Like India is not someone that licenses, if you will. This is permitted, uh, loosely speaking, but not licensed, if you will. What are your thoughts on that? Complete nonsense. Okay. Anything which interferes with your consciousness as given to you by divinity. Right. Is, uh, is, is is doesn't should not be okay. And I think it's all just excuses and and admitting it with you having tried several things before you know I got into my meditation. Yeah, I yeah, know yeah. that not only is that very temporary but also is very harmful. I see. And the consciousness that you develop, Carlos Castaneda and all of yeah, that, yeah. authors etc. Yeah. Is 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 nothing to do at all with your uh, evolving as a spiritual person. Okay. And, and, and it's just playing tricks with your mind. Okay. And as you said earlier, the idea is to go beyond your mind. Yeah. And these, all these things don't help with you to mind. do that. Yeah. Are playing with your yeah. mind. Yeah. And in fact, you know, in fancy messing yeah. with your mind. Yeah. So I, I'm completely clear now yeah. that in none, any of this is just a, just a simple, uh, you know, question of again, uh, you know, are 
uh, us telling that we can achieve even higher consciousness sure. by what we achieve, yeah. by what, yeah, we, by what attempt, we do, or what, what we, we do. do, right? Absolutely, and yes. and not uh, not to surrender, right? Which is what really the object should is what you require. How wonderful, sir! How wonderful! Absolutely wonderful, because you know a lot of these are being sold to us, uh-huh. and and the range is wide. You start from alcohol uh-huh. through you know fancy sort of uh, whatever sort of substances. I think they're all being only sold to us. marketing gimmicks. Yeah. And bad ones, yeah. because I think it's spoiler. There is no evidence, right. as far as I'm concerned. Right. And the sooner we get over this nonsense, I think the better off we are. Sure. And I think, and, and and the Indian tradition has been that of recognizing that you are the spirit, you are the atma, aham, and then as an atma, aham brahma asmi. Sure. So and you can achieve that, and you can become a part of the brahma by what you uh, you know do in terms of your own meditative state and being, in, as I said. First the nirvichar samadhi, yeah. and then what you get is the nirvikalp samadhi, which is the doubtless, doubtless consciousness, where you do what you do because you are doing it because you are connected. Sure. I mean, birds don't think why they fly. Why they are flying? Exactly. Yeah. They are flying. They are flying. And exactly. that's what they do. Yeah. And that's what we can be also. Yeah. So that this is so wonderful, sir. But you know, if you permit, I wanted to ask you a question. A lot of what you are talking about is Indian mm. in many ways, is spiritual in many ways. But your roots were more in Marxism. Mm. Uh, you were, in fact, a staunch Marxist. Uh, last night you were telling me stories about how you even met some of these people. Yes. Uh, could you just walk me through that journey and what happened? Why did you transform? Well, I got into it when I went into college as an avowed uh, pro-American guy. Okay. And I had got myself a book called uh, uh, The Communist Manifesto by, sure. uh, you know, by the introduction by A.G.P. Taylor, which rubbishes Communist Manifesto. I see. But then I was in, I was impressed by the intellect of my seniors who ragged me uh, in the interest of my national cause. Right. This was 1968, very difficult period when I got into college. So I got into Marxism not uh, for any other ideology, but to, in some sense, take the country forward and went very far ahead sure. and uh, got into what's later on known as Charu Majumdar, Kanu Sanyal line and that kind of thing and sure. uh, ran away from college, from St. Stephen's to come, see. to come and create a revolution in the villages of Bihar and therefore uh, risked my everything yeah. as it were. Yeah. Caused my parents a lot of grief being the only son who had gone to St. Stephen's. Right. So getting that to, and then I later on I came to Kolkata and met some of the very senior uh, people in this movement and I was saved by I think just simply divine grace. Otherwise, there is no reason for me to be sitting here I see. and talking to you because uh, you know I should have had a police record and so on. But, but what do I? I mean, um, there's I, been a very dramatic shift, if you will. Huge yeah. shift, and I came back to Lucknow. Yeah. And then rebuilt my career. And I remember studying um, sort of hard. And one of my friends, my colleague, she came to ask me, "Why do you study so hard?" You should look, read Marxism. So I said, look, I've done that. <laughs> now I want to bet, improve my marks yeah. and not follow Marx. Marxism. Right? <laughs> How so, wonderful. So that's the How way well put. it. And then I built up and and slowly I got disenchanted, if you like. Because, sure. And I tell you the story is that in the village of Bihar, the practice was that you had to uh, kill the Jyotedar yeah. with traditional weapons. Yeah. And when I put that to a group of people whom I, you know, uh, I, I used to work as a bricklayer, yeah. you know, with the you know with the friend with the person who was, some, and they said, "Are you mad? He's got weapons. What are you talking about? Yeah. Go, don't leave us alone. Go away." And that's when I started my journey back, and the journey back actually ended when I was in Oxford, because until then I was still you know not kind of convinced there, kind of that yeah. this was, yeah. that intellectually this is not a more powerful uh, ideology as yeah. it were. Yeah. And, Pol, and then Pol Pot happened, yeah. and that kind of you know gave me grief as it were. And then in Oxford, I read this book called The Secret Life of Plants, uh, which is uh, one of the most uh, well-documented books and says that plants have lives sure. and there is, uh, and they have consciousness and that we all can connect with that consciousness if we are working at that level. Now, that's a complete denial of Marxism. Yeah. Because yeah. Marxism says there is no consciousness, there is yeah. no spirit, yeah. there is only materialism. Yeah. And therefore, dialectic materialism, and that is when I said that this is uh, not just a false ideology, but an ideology which has done the world a lot of harm. So, absolutely wonderful, sir. But you know, it would be amiss of me, uh, given that I've had the good fortune to have you uh, actually join us here, to not talk a little bit about government. Yeah. I had a couple of questions around uh, the role of government, if you will. 
Uh, so first, obviously, is COVID done? Are we sort of done with it? Is this over? I think it's done. Okay. And I think we must uh, pat ourselves on the back and uh, give the government all the credit right. uh, for having done the vaccination program the way it's, it's become a world uh, sort of example. Record, yeah. The COVID, yeah. You know, the app itself, you yeah. know, I think it's amazing the kind of way and the fact that we were able to produce the vaccines ourselves. It's now taken mostly now the flu. Yeah. And people and doctors and people have all started treating it like that. And I right. hope that we don't get another virulent strain. And if we don't, then I think we, we are, are done. We are done with it. Yeah. And I, I think, you know, again, as a citizen, we don't like being told what to do. Mm. But the way in which the government, I think, sort of you know, orchestrated this entire thing, if you will, uh, both the need to do whatever you, you were required to do, whether it was staying at home or take the vaccine, and yet sort of uh, do it in a way that it didn't seem like sort of offensive to people. I think that was really wonderful. I think it was quite remarkable, yeah. actually. Yeah. It was quite remarkable. There was a time in the Delta stage, yeah. the second uh, thing, where things got a little out of hand because our infrastructure wasn't able to cope with it. But right. uh, beyond that, I think the communication yeah. uh, and also the availability and the organization yeah. have all been amazingly great. Sure. Sure. No wonderful. Sense. And even in the you know, hinterland, everywhere. Yeah. I think yeah. that's been amazing. There were stories of people literally walking yeah. miles yeah. to administer a vaccine. It's, it's quite, yeah. it's quite yeah. amazing. Which brings me to the next question, sir. Farming. Mm. I know you grow your own vegetables. I've actually had the good fortune to see and eat, in fact, some of the vegetables. But if you look at farming in India, at least the stories that you hear, and I think there is a little bit of a difference between farming in East India, which I think is still okay, but if you look at West India, you hear stories about farmers committing suicide and not getting the minimum support prices. There was this, you know, whole issue with the farmers in Punjab who actually sort of rebelled in some way. Uh, what's actually happening, sir? How can I, as a citizen, eat good, clean food that's been grown in a, you know, proper way? So, Ritesh, uh, we must go back to the beginning of the Green Revolution in 1967, 66, when we had the Bihar famine. Sure. And food security became a huge concern. And right. you know, remember the time it was said that we were living from ship to lip sure. because the PL-480 was being sent by the U.S. And right. That was a massive national catastrophe. Sure. So our scientists and our system, the ICAR, by pushing forward the Green Revolution, have done a huge service. Sure. So let's first recognize that, recognize sure. that and say that um, having 70 million tons of food grain stock and being able to export it is a, is a massive achievement that this country has made. Sure. But nobody expected to, sure. us to do that. But I think having said that, now I think it's time to move on. Okay. And it's time to move on simply because uh, the way we are practicing agriculture is just completely unsustainable. Okay. Both environmentally, financially, and in terms of health. Sure. Because the amount of fertilizer that we are using, chemical fertilizer and pesticide and weedicide, etc., yeah. is uh, in all possible ways, is, is just not sustainable at all. And I'll give you one figure. But at the time for independent, and this comes by the way from the Institute of uh, Institute of Soil Sciences in Bhopal, okay. established during pre-colonial times, that at, at that in 1947, our the organic carbon content of our soil, which makes the soil cult arable, yeah. was uh, two and a half percent. The amount of car organ carbon content you need is 1.5 percent, and today our national average is 0.4 percent. I see. We have converted our land into deserts, actually, and therefore what we need is to keep putting in more and, and more, yeah. you know, chemical inputs and fertilizers and all of that. And as you would know, the marginal returns to that keep declining, right. and the costs keep going up, and which is then what leads to, with a little bit of hiccup here and there, to farmer distress. Sure. That they just can't get the returns that they must, and which is why the demand for legalizing minimum support prices and so on and so forth. Now, right. I think we have to shift to a completely new paradigm. And that paradigm is already in the making. Okay. And it's called natural farming. It's okay. called Prakriti Kheti. Okay. Sometimes people call it, you know, Subhash Palekar Prakriti Kheti. He's the one who, you know, had made, has made a huge, uh, you know, uh, campaign of it. About 30 million farmers in India are practicing that in 11 states. And the last three years in Niti Aayog, I have given that a huge push. Okay. You know, and, and we've now got a website of that. And it is now proven that it's uh, it improves your organic carbon content. It reduces your water intake by about uh, two thirds. Okay. Only you know you have zero cost because you don't use any chemical inputs at all. And the yields, while they drop to begin with, can catch up in the next two or three years uh, to become as good as the ones with all these crops. 
plus the fact that the farmer's health, when he's sort of just throwing the fertilizer. Yeah, 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 yeah. Farm, you forget that, exactly. That's prevented. Yeah. Each apple or brinjal or aubergine brinjal is sprayed 16, 15 times with chemicals. So the consumption, consumer's health is compromised. We yeah. didn't have, I mean, you know about these uh, cancer trains which travel from Bhatenda to Bikaner. Yeah. Because there is a cancer hospital there. Yeah. All the farmers. Yeah. That's happened because of all these practices. Right. And our water table has gone down. Our energy subsidies are rising. All of that can change. And okay. I'm very happy to say that uh, the Prime Minister, uh, from the 16th of November last year and then twice again has now given it its full support okay. that we have to shift to this. And uh, the fact is that the, the, the German Bundestag has now uh, res resolved to assist anywhere where you practice agroecology. I see. And I've just given 30 million euros to a set up an institute of natural farming in Andhra. Okay. So I think that's the way forward. And uh, if we do that, We'll be able to consume better food. Our health will be better, and I'm assured. I can say this with great confidence that if we switch the way we should by handholding the farmer, by training them, by you know leading them, no mandating of it, we will achieve our food security, and at the same time achieve environmental sustainability, better health, better lower water consumption, and lower power uh, consumption. So I, I think see. That's the way to go forward. And, and for, for my understanding, sir, this is applicable to all types of fruits and vegetables, this crops, This is applicable grains. to all. I see. You know, in Himachal Pradesh now, uh, they are, they've got apple orchards which are purely, uh, you know, grow, coming up on this. Their shelf lives are better. Their tastes are better. And you know that my wife is a yeah. farmer. Yeah, and for course, the last yeah. three and a half, four years, yeah. you know, we've been practicing this natural farming. Everybody who's eaten the fruits and vegetables coming out of a farm, and even the wheat, and the rice and mustard have said that this is far better. I see. And you get better prices. And the, there is a huge export market waiting for this. Right. You know, so the farmer's income can actually double and triple and so on because the wheat, indigenous wheat called Kapali yeah. or Sona Moti, yeah. sells for four times the price yeah. than the ordinary hybrid variety because the gluten content is much less right. and the protein content is much higher. Right. So I think that's the way. Uh, and by the way, also, this will also take care of your very large cattle population. Okay. Because the cattle will then be useful also for their, uh, their, their manure and the urine and, uh, and not just the milk. And they can be sustained as, as a provider of inputs uh, to this farming rather than only commercial dairy as the way it is now at the moment. I, see. I think that's the way forward. How wonderful, sir. And so just from again, from my understanding and maybe for the people listening as well, how would I distinguish or how would I tell? Like when, when food has been grown this way, is there, well, there a, is a process is it of organic? Or? There is a process of certification okay. for organic uh, farming. Okay. But I think this process of certification needs to be, uh, needs to be far improved right. and made much more common on the ground. Pervasive, right. Uh, pervasive, as yeah. it were. And, uh, and all our Krishi Vikas Kendras yeah. uh, can be trained into this form of farming and certifying that these lands have been are chemical free right. as we go forward. Right. I think what you need therefore is a very widespread system of uh, testing and certification. Right. And and once you have that, then you will build the consumer's confidence as well. Right. Plus also the confidence of those uh, abroad right. uh, to be able to consume that. But that, yes, that needs to be done. So one of the concerns that I've heard, uh, and obviously I'm no expert in the subject, that you need to not sort of uh, till the land for a couple of years as you migrate away from you know, what you were doing in the past to... Not true. Okay. You can do both. Okay. The, the non-till bit is the Japanese, I think, uh, Fukuoka okay. sort of style. But you can till it, we till it, we till our land. Okay. But the tilling itself becomes less and less. You I don't see. have to do it as deep. Okay. Because, the, you know, because what happens is that gradually, uh, you know, the soil de you know, grows earthworms, which are the best tillers sure. in the world. Sure. They sure. go, I think, 20 feet down and yeah. then come back up there. So the aeration takes place uh, in itself. But uh, uh, you see, the, 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 the thing to remember here is also, as, as in all cases, you know, to avoid extremism right. you know, and to make this into any fetish. Yeah. So let the farmer you know, use his own you know, uh, uh, common sense, uh, you know, apply this in conjunction or in, you know, in, 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 in the context of the land and the atmosphere that they are in, that is, that they are in yeah. and not just become a fetish you know, that no, all this is banned and we only, Correct. we'll only this way, because that Correct. then leads to 
Correct. Correct. So you have to have the flexibility yeah. and the you know and the patience to take it forward. Right. And and if you do that, then I think the farmer is also the wisest person. Of course. As they see the results, yeah. they adopt it. Yeah. Wonderful. So on that wonderful note of hope, actually, in many ways that there is a future for us as a nation, there's a future for us as uh, consumers, there's a future for the farming community in our world. I'd like to actually bring this conversation to a close. Obviously, we can keep speaking. Every time I speak with you, I learn so much. And I hope the people listening to this conversation have learned as well. But I know your time is uh, limited and I don't want to take uh, more advantage than I perhaps deserve. So thank you so much. Truly, truly, truly appreciate your thank making you. this time. Thank you very much. Coming to Calcutta great. and uh, sort of uh, doing this for us. Thank you very really much. Really appreciate it. a great pleasure. Right. And I wish you all the success. And yes, uh, you and I and all of us have to be optimists. Right. Uh, and, and, and make sure uh, that India does achieve its destiny. Absolutely. To become the Vishwaguru. Absolutely. Forward. Wonderful, sir. Thank you so much.